Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of protocol uh, design in CT. And uh, in the first part, we went to some basic principles, and then we spoke about oral contrast. And now we're going to speak more about uh, IV contrast and a little bit more about oral contrast. So one of the things we mentioned about oral contrast is when should you use water? Now, I mentioned before that if you're looking at things like GI bleeds, water is great. If you're looking for CT angiography, seat water is great. If you can't give positive contrast in the ER setting, for whatever reason, the doctors are giving you a hard time, whatever, use water. No one gets hurt by water. The patients are thirsty, they'll drink it quickly. This is a good example. This previously had been a scan in an ER setting, which was normal. Here's a patient back with abdominal pain. And with the water in place, you very obviously see the infiltration of the body and the entry of the stomach by a patient with gastric adenocarcinoma. Now you can say, would I have been able to see without water? The answer is yes or no, I don't know. But how many times do you see nobody commenting on the stomach or saying stomach is undistended, cannot exclude tumor, advise clinical correlation or repeat scan, or they say nothing? Water works really well also if you're looking at things like Crohn's disease, where you're looking for the enhancement of the bowel, you're looking for strictures, which you can see here, and then when you give IV contrast material, the enhancement of the submucosa, the vas erecta are all nicely seen. Now, if I'm looking at a patient with suspected Crohn's or known Crohn's looking for complications, and I can't give IV, then I'll always use positive oral contrast material. You also would want to use positive oral contrast material if you're looking for fistulae, because adherent bowel, it's hard to tell if there's really a fistula present with positive contrast and lots of it. It's easy to tell if there's a fistula present and you can track the fistula. Again, here's a good example with water as the contrast agent. The disease activity is high. That sort of comb sign with very prop positive and prominent vas erecta, beautifully seen on the left with MIP and on the right with volume rendering. Or this case, one of the things that's very important uh, is to do reconstructions, including MIP imaging when you're looking at bowel. Here's a good example. This patient had GI bleed. It wasn't quite clear. It was sort of a chronic process. And this was initially read as negative. You don't really appreciate much, but then if you look at the cecum and if you really concentrate, it looks like there's more enhancement there than there should be and that there is in the rest of the bowel right there. But then if you do a coronal MIP image, look at those prominent vessels and all that vessel tortuosity and that feeding ileocolic vessel. It's just beautifully shown. This was angiodysplasia. This was the source of bleeding, and eventually this was resected. On slices, you just can't appreciate it. Even on the coronal view, you can't appreciate it, but you really can appreciate it nicely on the MIP imaging, nicely shown there. I mentioned if you're looking for GI bleed, you don't want anything positive in the bowel, so you don't give positive oral contrast, you give water. So here you can see very nicely on a protocol, you see some high density in the bowel right there. That's the bleed. Now we get dual phase on bleeding because it's been my, it's been our experience, I wouldn't say my experience, but it's our experience, that bleeds often show best on venous phase. Also, when you see changes from arterial to venous phase that are extensive, that increases the likelihood angiography done a couple years later or a couple days later for the bleeding will indeed be positive. And here you can see image on your left, image on your right. We're going from arterial to venous. Look how much more impressive the bleed is on axial and how much more impressive the bleed is on the coronal views. Now you could say, well, could you do non-contrast and then do arterial? That's what people would recommend. But I noticed, and the main reason for non-contrast, is there something dense in the bowel? Is it real or a bleed? Well, my experience is, if it's a bleed, it will always change appearance between arterial and venous phase. If it doesn't change, it's not a bleed. And then if you only do arterial phase, and this is a good example, it's very easy to walk by something. The venous makes it much more obvious and gives us other additional information. Now, the last thing with oral contrast I should mention is volumen. Volumen was popular for a while, particularly for patients um, for GI bleeding, for patients who had malabsorption. Uh, the problem is with uh, volumen, what you're doing is, you're, in a sense, you're creating diarrhea. It has methylcellulose. You're bringing water into bowel. 
That's a good thing because it distends the bowel, but patients often get substantial diarrhea. Here's a normal a volumen case. You can see the bowel looks distended. If you didn't know there was volumen, you would say the patient has diarrhea. So volumen can be helpful picking up subtle things in things like sprue. So if I'm evaluating someone with malabsorption, I will use it, but otherwise water works very nicely. Here's an example of multiple polyps of the duodenum in a patient with volumen being used. Okay, nicely shown there again. And if you want to see our contrast protocols with a little bit more detail, uh, we have a app in the App Store that you can download, and I swear I'm going to update this app sooner or later. Now let's focus on IV contrast. IV contrast to me is the most concerning part of the CT exam. And it's not because I worry about contrast reactions, and it's not because I worry about renal failure. It's because I always worry about extravasation. Never do harm to a patient, and extravasation is what worries me the most. Now you say, what are the factors that can lead to extravasation? Is it the injection rate? Is it the volume of contrast we give? Is it the type of contrast? Is it the gauge needle we use? Is it the type of needle? And the answer is, the most important thing is where the needle is placed and the size of the needle. And so when you put an IV catheter in the hand, because it looks like the easiest vein to get, that's the highest area of extravasation. The veins look good, but they're not. The other thing is you tend to put a 22 gauge, not an 18 or a 20, because you don't want to put that into the hand. But with a 22 gauge, that will increase the frequency of extravasation as well. Extravasation rate in this article by Weinbeck was highest with 22 gauge IV catheters independent of anatomic location. For 20 gauge IV catheters, extravasation rates were higher, significantly higher in the dorsum of the hand versus the antecubital fossa. And finally, extravasation rates were higher in older patients. So again, needle size, location of placement, and age. Older patients are more fragile, their veins are more likely to rupture. So again, you need to be exceedingly careful in that group of patients. Now, one of the things also is important to know, we like to do CT angio. We like fast injection rates. So we always want an 18 gauge catheter. But when we look back, often the nurses who are starting the IVs who know things who are really excellent at Hopkins, know they can't get an 18 in a patient. And when you start looking back, probably in a third of cases, non-18 gauge catheters were placed, you were doing 20s or 22s, and so you were not able to get what you wanted. Sometimes it was because a needle was placed and then there was extravasation or it didn't work, but many times it was just a judgment call. Well, the good news is a couple years back, a new type of catheter was developed. Remember, all needles to date had a single hole at the bottom, kind of like a rocket ship, and so you'd have a force going out that needle that would hit the wall and could create all sorts of issues. But Beck and Dickinson, and I have no conflict of interest, though we did some of the original work on that with them, put a needle with multiple side holes. And so by having those multiple side holes, it's called an exiva catheter, you're able to decrease the force of the injection, yet still manage to get the volume and rate of contrast that you need. A 20 gauge fenestrated catheter performs similar to an 18 gauge with respect to contrast infusion rates, aortic enhancement levels, and can be placed instead of an 18 gauge catheter. That's fantastic. And in fact, when you look carefully at what they say, 20 and 22, even their 22 can be 6.5 cc's a second, which is more than essentially every study we do. Um, and a 24, so you can do that in peds, it's three cc's a second. The 20 gauge can do up to 10. Why would you ever use an 18? We don't inject 15 cc's a second. So a 20 is what we typically we put in. What I like about these catheters also, it says the flow rate on the catheter, that the purple, you can see the PSI. It's important to remember 325 PSI. Most of the non-fenestrated catheters use 300 PSI. So that's important when you set things up. So it's important to look at that. And again, 
Uh, it takes a little bit of training, but not very long to use these catheters. If you've used B and D catheters before, the learning curve is particularly fast. If you've used other catheters, there's a slight learning curve, but it really is the right thing to do. It really can help you get really good injection rates in all of your patients. And we know that the injection rate is critical in both diagnosing lesions and tracking lesions. You want to scan the same rate every study so you can see in this vascular neuroendocrine tumor, is the tumor changing because of chemotherapy or because of our injection rate? And you can see the nodes, the implants on the left hemidiaphragm, the tumor in the liver. And with good injection rates, you can do MIP imaging, looking at neovascularity. With good injection rates, you can do AI. Now, in terms of intravenous contrast, what do we use? We either use Omni 350 or Visi 320. The risk from contrast agents I mentioned to you, to me, it's extravasation. But there was these monstrous charts a few years back, and this came over from MR, that if patients had GFRs below 60, they were at risk. Now we have learned, and we've always said it, that you know all of the data done was based on older contrast agents, patients who were kept dehydrated for, for hours, patients with large volumes of contrast. Now with things like Omnipake and Visipake, we don't have those issues. And now it's pretty clear that GFR is above 30, patients are fine. So all of these complex charts that were present a couple years ago are gone. And in fact, it even made it to NPR last year, pre-COVID, that the risks that for imaging studies from contrast agents are truly overblown. And if you want to hear a really nice discussion, and if you want to have something that your patients can listen to, it's very good on NPR. And of course, this article from the ACR and the National Kidney Foundation made the point, in individual high-risk circumstances, prophylactics may be considered in patients with a GFR rate of uh, 30 to 44, but typically above 30 is not going to be a problem. This article said Davenport the risk of acute renal injury in patients with reduced renal function following exposure to IV contrast has been overstated. And we've been saying this for more than a decade. This is due primarily to historic lack of control groups sufficient to separate contrast-induced AKI, that is AKI caused by contrast media, from contrast-associated AKI, which means incidental. The patients have other issues going on. So that indeed becomes very important. Patients with a AKR EGFR less than 30 should prompt consideration by the referring radiologist to discuss the risks. But even then, as long as the risk reward is in favor of doing the study, we will actually do it. They also comment the presence of a solitary kidney is not an independent risk factor. And everyone thinks, oh, you only have one kidney. If one kidney is there and is normally functioning, giving contrast is not going to be an increased risk factor. And there's so many nice articles. Newhouse, this is more than 12 years ago. Creatinine level increases in patients who are not receiving contrast material as often as it does in published series of patients receiving contrast. That is the issue. It was always felt that your creatinine level, if you came in with a creatinine of one, it was one throughout your hospitalization. Then if you got contrast and you measured it, it was 1.7, you'd be, oh my God, you've induced renal problems. It went up more than 0.5. But if you take the same patient every day, particularly oncology patients, the numbers are going 1 to 1.5 to 1.8 to 2.2. 2. It's all over the place. And so if you give contrast, if you give them Diet Coke, you're going to say Diet Coke increases the uh, creatinine levels. So it's very, very important. And this article from Hopkins made the point in the ER setting over a five-year period, we did not have a single instance of contrast-induced nephropathy. And so that made the assumption that we probably weren't giving IV contrast enough, that they were too strict on who should get contrast. Very important factor. And again, contrast administration was not associated with increased incidence of chronic kidney disease, dialysis, or renal transplant at six months when you looked out longer. And again, here's just a really good look and how the complexity, I showed you the chart before, how things are a lot less complicated now. Now, in terms of renal function and IV contrast, for dialysis patients, additional labs will not be needed as dialysis patients 
are already recognized as having a GFR under 30 and they're going to be dialyzed. We used to like to say within 24 hours, that's probably a good idea, but it doesn't always need to be that way. If patients have had any of the following risk factors and there is no EGFR on record within 90 days, a serum creatinine EGFR will be performed. And those are patients who had renal issues, whether it's transplantation, a nephrectomy, a chronic kidney disease, the EHR, or documentation of any EGFR value within 90 days that is less than 30. So in patients who have risk factors, we're even more careful. In patients having any of the following risk factors, if there's no GFR on record within 90 days, a point of care will be performed. Patients over 60, patients with diabetes, or again, patients with some of the renal risk factors. And here's a very simple chart we use. Again, uh, what agent you pick will be dependent on your institution. Our PEDS patients all get Visipake. Our um, adult patients, when they start getting lower renal function, they'll get Visipake. But Visipake can be given. Certain patients is a better selection. Oncology patients, for example, who are being treated, who have all sorts of nephrotoxic drugs, something like Visipake may be the right thing to do. Now, other things in terms of contrast, you want to use a warmer. The answer is yes. 90% of people don't have warmers, so they're not using them. But a warmer is terrific. Also, you need to keep track of the temperature. No one has developed a monitoring thing for your iPhone, which needs to be done. Also, when you put contrast in the warmer, you have to label it, kind of like milk, when it's going to expire, not the date you put it in there. But those are all easy things to do. Warming of contrast is particularly helpful with faster injection rates. At 5 cc's per section injection rate, which is what we do routinely, if you don't warm the contrast, all things being equal, you triple the rates of extravasation, okay? Intravenously injected arterial studies, uh, which timing is critical, warming the contrast also is critical. And again, this idea about increasing the extravasation rate just by simply not warming the contrast tells you you need to warm the contrast. Extrinsic warming to 37 degrees reduced allergic-like reactions, okay? Another value proposition. You warm the contrast, there's no, there's no issues or there's decreased issues with allergic-type reactions. Now, buy a warmer. Don't go on eBay today and buy a warmer. This pre-owned warmer, you got to read carefully. Um, what does it say there? It says that uh, it's sort of working but the power cord is frayed. You don't want to burn down your hospital. So buy a good warmer. Don't buy one of these old ones. Now, in terms of prep, let me just mention a few things. I like a 24-hour prep, 12 24 2, and the reason I like that is because when I spoke to our allergists, they said you need 24 hours of uh, cortisone in order for the uh, best effect. ACR has a 13-hour presentation. Uh, some people talk about a five-hour prep. Again, faster premedications should reduce the indirect harms of premedication in hospitalized patients. And this 13 hours seems to work well, but if you can do 24, it's an outpatient, I say do 24. Again, if someone comes in and they need a scan, it's acute chest pain, you worry about the section, you can't wait 24 hours, you can't wait 13, you can't wait five, you can't even wait an hour. Everything is risk-reward. We'll push 100 milligrams of cyamedrol and then do the study. Now, there's no great literature on that, but our experience has been very good, but you need to watch the patient very carefully. Now, one thing also people forget about is delayed reactions, which are defined as an event more than one hour to one week after contrast injection, though the majority occur between three hours and two days. It's uncommon, but more common with Visipake. It's seldom reported to the radiologist because the patients are gone. Some patients have small rashes. You put a little bit of cortisone on it or something. But some people have severe, even life-threatening reactions that need to be treated with antihistamines and corticosteroids and even admission to the hospital. The problem with patients who get delayed reactions is recurrence rates are pretty high. So what's very important to do is to change the contrast agent. We'll pre-medicate them, yes, but if they got Omnipig before, give them Visi. If they got Visi before, give them Omnipig. Change the contrast. That works out very nicely, okay? Now, um, 
What about, you know, giving a couple doses of contrast? In the absence of contraindications, encouraging urgent care physicians to order IV contrast exams is what you want to do. Do not be doing the patient twice. If you think they need IV contrast, do it the first time. This is getting into the ER doc saying do no oral, no IV. If you know you're going to need IV, give it the first time. Remember, we spend so much effort trying to decrease dose. The best way I've always said of decreasing dose in patients is to do the study right the first time. Okay, that becomes very important to reduce potentially medical unnecessary redundant imaging within a short time frame. Use IV contrast from the get go. Do it right the first time. Now, another thing we'll speak about in terms of protocols is how we look at the images. In 2021, truthfully, in 2000, you need to look at the multiplanar images. And let's take a five minute break and come back and we'll finish up with part three of our protocol lecture. See you in a few moments. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.